All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take 1 Kings chapter 10, the Queen of Sheba visits Solomon. And we'll just take the first verse where the Queen of Sheba arrives at Jerusalem. Now, when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. So Sheba was where modern-day Yemen is today, southern Arabia. And we know from the geography that this was a wealthy kingdom with much gold, spices, and precious woods. History also tells us that they were known to have queens as well as kings. And this was a long trip, up to about 1,500 miles or 2,400 kilometers, and she probably came as part of the trade delegation in 1 Kings chapter 10 verses 2 through 5, but there is no doubt that she was highly motivated to see Solomon and his kingdom. So she came to Solomon and Israel at their uh, material zenith. The great prosperity, splendor, and wisdom of Solomon's kingdom were internationally famous at this time. So Sheba may also be the land of the uh, Sabians in Job chapter 1 verse 15, Ezekiel chapter 23 verse 42, and Joel chapter 3 verse 8. The Sabian people over whom the queen ruled were governed by priest kings in Psalm 72 verse 10. Solomon's expeditions to the east by sea in 1 Kings chapter 9 verse 26 through 28 would have brought him news of his prosperous and important Arabian kingdom. So the queen's primary purpose in visiting Solomon seems to have been to see if he really was wise and wealthy. All right, verses 2 through 5, what the queen of Sheba saw. So she came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all of her questions, and there was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the witness or the service of his waiters, and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. So this queen traveled in the manner of queens with a large royal procession heavily laden with gifts and goods for trade. So Solomon's kingdom was famous not only for its material prosperity, but also for his great wisdom. The queen of Sheba had great and seemingly difficult questions, and Solomon answered all of her questions. The hard questions weren't just riddles, but included difficult diplomatic and ethical questions. The test was not an academic exercise, but to see if he would be a trustworthy business party and a reliable ally capable of giving help. So this queen was obviously familiar with the world of royal splendor and luxury, yet she was completely overwhelmed by the wisdom of Solomon and the glory of his kingdom. What happened to the Queen of Sheba is a natural and not an uncommon effect, which will be produced in the delicate, sensible mind at the sight of a rare and extraordinary production of art, right? This guy could back up what he was saying, big time. A lot of people talk big game. All right, verses 6 through 9, how the queen of Sheba reacted. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe all the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne throne of Israel. Because the Lord has loved Israel forever, therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness. So the queen of Sheba, she heard all these wonderful things about Solomon and his kingdom, but upon seeing it with her own eyes, she realized that it was far greater than she had heard. And it is a joyful thing to serve a great, wise, and rich king. If it was a happy thing to serve Solomon, it is a much happier thing to serve Jesus Christ. Right, And this is an example of what God wanted to do for Israel under the promises of the Old Covenant given to Israel. God promised Israel that if they obeyed under the Old Covenant, notice my emphasis there, uh, he would bless them so tremendously that the world would notice and give glory to the Lord God of Israel. Right? So Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 10. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. So God wanted to reach the nations through an obedient and blessed Israel. If Israel did not obey, then God would speak to the nations through a thoroughly disciplined Israel, right? He would would chasten them. 
So it is fair to ask if this was a true confession of faith, expressing allegiance to the God of Israel. Taken in their context, these may not be more than the queen's response to the astonishing blessing evident in Solomon's Jerusalem, right? Her statement about the blessings of the Lord on Israel and Solomon in verse 9 were no more than a polite reference to Solomon's God. There is no record that she accepted Solomon's God, who was so majestically edified by the temple. So praise to the Lord implies recognition of Israel's national God and need not necessarily be an expression of personal faith. And if we take the Queen of Sheba as an example of a seeker, we see that Solomon impressed her with his wealth and splendor, and also impressed her personally. But she returned home without an evident expression of faith in the God of Israel. This shows that impressing seekers with facilities and programs and organization and professionalism isn't enough. Regardless of the result of her search, we can admire her seeking, right? She came from a great distance. She came with gifts. She came to question and learn. She came and saw the riches of the king. She came for an extended period, and she came telling all that was in her heart. Jesus Christ used the Queen of Sheba as an example of a seeker in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, which states, The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. If the Queen of Sheba thought Solomon and the splendor of his kingdom so diligent, how much more should people today seek Jesus and the glory of his kingdom? She will certainly also rise up in judgment against this generation as well. So, uh, the statement she made is especially meaningful because Solomon was not necessarily the most logical successor of his father David. There were several sons of David born before Solomon. It was God's special act to make him king rather than his elder brother, which we covered earlier. All right, verses 10 through 13, you're going to get an exchange of gifts. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices in great quantity, and precious stones. There never, again, uh, there never again came such abundance of spices as the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Also, the ships of Haram, which brought gold from Ophir, brought great quantities of almug wood and precious stones from Ophir. And the king made steps of the almug wood for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Also harps and stringed instruments for singers. And there never again came such Almug wood, nor has the like been seen to this day. Now King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired, whatever she asked, because or besides what Solomon had given her according to the royal generosity. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. So she came from a region rich in spices and skilled in the processing of spices. To give according to the royal generosity means to give a lot. And this description of Solomon's measure of generosity to the Queen of Sheba also describes the measure of God's generosity towards us. According to tradition, fanciful stories perhaps, the Queen of Sheba wanted a son by Solomon and he obliged her. Her child was named Menelik and he became the ancestor of all subsequent Ethiopian monarchs, supposedly. All right, so the queen was quite wealthy herself. She gave Solomon 120 talents of gold. That's four and a half tons. Great quantities of spices and precious stones. So these verses, which seem out of place here, may reflect a trade arrangement that resulted from the queen's visit. Ophir might have been close to or part of the queen's kingdom of Sheba, chapter 9, verse 28. Almug wood is strong and beautiful, black on the outside, ruby red on the inside, and it's long-lasting. Solomon used it in the temple steps in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 11, as well as for other purposes mentioned here. And in verse 13, this visit gives rise to the legend surrounding Menelik I and the successive kings of Ethiopia. Ethiopia. The tradition that the ark was taken, leaving a replica, appears uh, that will appear to be non-biblical. However, it seems that it may indeed have been taken to Egypt and then to Ethiopia during the days of Manasseh to protect it from his ravages. And you can see Second Chronicles uh, 35 for that. All right, verses 14 and 15, Solomon's yearly income. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. Uh-oh, notice the numbers. Besides that, from the traveling merchants, from the income of traders, from all the kings of Arabia, and from all the governors of the country. All right, 666 talents of gold. This is a vast amount of gold which came to Solomon yearly. 
uh, we will notice these number significance in the Bible. One commentator uh, will set the value of 666 talents of gold at 281,318,400 according to the value of gold in 2015. It would be just under $1 billion. And this speaks not only to the great wealth of Solomon, but it also makes him the only other person in the Bible associated with the number 666. The other biblical connection to 666 is the end times world dictator and opponent of God and his people, often known as the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. In fact, the Revelation passage specifically says that the number 666 is the number of a man, and the man may be Solomon, right? And this isn't to say that Solomon was the Antichrist or that the coming Antichrist will be some strange reincarnation of Solomon, but it may indicate that the Antichrist may not be someone purely evil from from the very beginning. Instead, he may be like Solomon, a good man that becomes corrupted. So Solomon received more than, and you'll notice that Solomon started in a time of peace. The Antichrist will do the same thing. We'll start in peace, and then at the three and a half year mark, he'll change it. <laughs> he'll go against it. So Solomon received more than 606 talents of gold a year. The 666 talents was just his beginning salary. The writer of First Kings will give us a warning signal here. He assumes that we know the instructions for future kings of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. He assumes that we know verse 17 of that passage, which says, Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. God blessed Solomon with great riches, but Solomon allowed that blessing to turn into a danger because he disobediently multiplied silver and gold for himself. Notice the difference. Nothing wrong with money. It's how you use it and where your obsessions go. Verse 14, uh, looking back, God told his kings not to multiply the gold in Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, but Solomon disobeyed. And the fabled number 666 is regarded by some as a link or a type to Solomon's reign, right? A type that would look forward. It appears twice and only in this regard other than the famed Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, right? And we get that link from the Old Testament to the New Testament there. There are over 800 allusions in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament, this being one of many. All right, verses 16 through 27, examples of Solomon's wealth and prosperity. And King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. He also made 300 shields of hammered gold. Three minas of gold went into each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. And the throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round at the back. And there were armrests on either side of the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the armrest. Twelve lions stood there, one on each side of the six steps. Nothing like this had been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold, and all the vessels of his house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Not one was silver. For this was accounted as nothing in the days of Solomon, for the king had merchant ships at sea with the fleet of Haram, and once every three years the merchant ships came bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and monkeys. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his heart. And each man brought his present articles of silver and gold, garments, ar armor, spices, horses, mules, at a set rate year by year. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores which are in the lowland. So these shields were made beautiful displays in the house of the forest of Lebanon, right, his palace. But they were of no use in battle. Gold was too heavy and too soft to be used as a metal for effective shields. This shows that Solomon had the image of a warrior king, but without the substance. According to Dilday, each large shield was worth about $120,000, or 250000 in 2015 values. The smaller shields were worth... Uh, 57,000 at 2015 values. 33 million was invested in gold ceremonial shields, right? So this is a statement of wealth. If taken seriously, it shows the tremendous abundance in Solomon's kingdom. Truly, King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And the promises of Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14 were fulfilled in his reign, right? The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many 
many nations, but you shall not borrow. Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. And we'll see that this is another fulfillment of the promises of Deuteronomy 28, right? All the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, right? And the, Deuteronomy 28 says, And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall be above only and not be beneath, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God. Verse 13 of Deuteronomy 28. So in comparison to the reign of David, there were few military conflicts during the reign of Solomon, yet he still saw the importance of a strong defense. And perhaps there were a few military conflicts because Solomon had a strong defense. And the remains of Solomon's fortress and stables at Megiddo can be seen today. And when we, see, when we think of Solomon's great wealth, we also consider that he originally did not set his heart upon riches. He deliberately asked for wisdom to lead the people of God instead of riches or fame. God promised to also give Solomon riches and fame, and God fulfilled his promise. We also consider that Solomon gave an eloquent testimony to the vanity of riches as the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes. He powerfully showed that there was no ultimate satisfaction through materialism. And we don't have to be as rich as Solomon to learn the same lesson. All right, verse 17, the house of the force of Lebanon in chapter 7, verses 2 through 5, and chapter 10, verse 21, it must have served as an armory, among other things. Each large shield was made of 600 beccas, or 7.5 pounds of gold, and each small shield had three minas, or um, three fourth pounds of gold. In Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 16, the small shields are said to be made of 300 beccas of gold, but this is the same amount expressed in a different unit of measure. Evidently, these 500 shields were intended for parade use rather than for battle, as gold is a soft metal. And verse 20, the 12 lions, one on each end of the six steps to the throne, might have been intended to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 22, the Solomon's fleet of traders brought riches from the distant lands. The apes and the baboons, or peacocks, uh, depending on the translation, might have been pets in vogue at the time. Tarshish or Tharshish is a mystery. It's a Sanskrit or Aryan word meaning the seacoast. A seacoast or island in uh, Isaiah 23, verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 9, Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 12, and uh, John chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 4, verse 2, the west of Palestine in Genesis chapter 10, verse 4, and 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 7. It's uh, mistakenly located in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 21 on the coast of the Red Sea. The beaten silver, uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 9, silver, iron, tin, and lead were brought from there by the people of Tyre in Ezekiel 27, verse 12. Tarshish is associated with an island in Isaiah 23, verse 6, and uh, chapter 6, 6, verse 19. And Jonah attempted to go there by ship in uh, Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Solomon also sent ships there as well. In Second Chronicles chapter nine verse twenty one, but the identification is not at all clear. Some scholars will put forward uh, Tardesus in southern Spain, to which, according to the classical authorities, the Phoenicians sailed with their ships to obtain silver, iron, and tin. Uh, Josephus' identification with Tarsus in uh, Sicilia is accepted by many scholars today, and some are going to associate it with uh, Britannia as a source of tin in Ezekiel twenty seven verse twelve. Others with India, and it is to this point that Jonah's ship was about to sail from Joppa, and it is the subject of many conjectures because of its prophetic allusion to Ezekiel 38, verse 13. And in verse 26, chariots were the most effective and dreaded military machines of the day. Their mobility and versatility gave Israel a great military advantage and discouraged enemies from invading the wealthy nation. Solomon's chariot cities, some have suggested, were Gezer, Hazor, and Megiddo, and it has been said that uh, little things portray the true character of a man more than certainly the great ones. A casual reader might see little significance in the king's assembling horses. However, the Mosaic law in anticipation of the monarchy particularly forbade the king of Israel to amass horses from Egypt. In Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 16, the fact that Egypt has not been known for breeding horses presents some difficulty here. Uh, he purchased horse, horses from Egypt. Some take the Hebrew word translated Egypt as, in reality, a place in Sicilia, Musser, and from Ku, uh, probably Sicilia in modern-day Turkey. The horses may have been bred in Sicilia, and Egypt uh, may have been the trader. The Hittites and Syrians also supplied that market as well. All right, verses 28 and 29, Solomon's interest in horses. Also, Solomon had horses imported from Egypt and Kiveh, and the king's merchants brought them in Kiveh at the current price. Now, a chariot that was imported from Egypt cost 600 shekels of silver and a horse 150, and thus 
through their agents, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So at the end of this great description of Solomon's wealth and splendor, we have the sound of this dark note. And this was in direct disobedience to Deuteronomy 17, verse 16, which said the kings of Israel, right? And we'll say that... uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 6 states, But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, You shall not return that way again. Okay, so this may explain why Solomon broke such an obvious commandment, right, through their agents that they exported them to all the kings. Perhaps the importation of horses from Egypt began as a trading, as an agent on behalf of other kings. And from this, uh, perhaps Solomon could say, I'm importing horses from Egypt, but I'm not doing Doing it for myself. I'm not breaking God's command. Uh, many examples of gross disobedience begin as clever rationalizations. And you got to watch out for rationalization with sin. All right, so he brought or bought a chariot for 600 silver shekels or 15 pounds. And a horse cost 150 silver shekels or three and three quarter pounds. In exporting some of them to the Hittites and the Arameans, he presumably made a significant profit on them. And though Solomon's wealth enabled him to purchase large quantities, quantities of horses and chariots. This practice was specifically prohibited in the Mosaic Law, Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. The reason for this prohibition was that the Lord wanted his people to depend on him for their protection. The presence of the strong physical defenses in Israel turned the hearts of Solomon and the people away from the Lord with a false sense of security, as is often the case. An abundance of material benefits leads people to think that they have no needs, when in reality their need for God never diminishes, ever. All right. That ties up chapter 10. Next time, we'll get into chapter 11, and we'll begin to speak about Solomon's apostasy. Thank you for joining me.